Good morning, brethren. Today, Brother Matt's sermon will be Acts chapter 20, verses 32. And now, Brother Matt, I commend you God, to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among them which all are sanctified. Now I'll have a prayer before Brother Matt comes up. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that we'll have a good day and that Brother Man will have strength to speak and we will have eyes to see and ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much, Seth. Now, brethren, we have talked in these meetings at some length already this week concerning this eternal purpose that God is working out through Jesus Christ in the present and that it is one that involves a calling out, a, a separation this is a separation that is being made, a distinction, a division. And actually, really, from the highest vantage point, what's happening here is a divine choice is being evidenced. As we continue to look into this this morning, we're going to see somewhat the purpose for the, the, the direction that all of this is heading in. Now, we've heard so far this week about the nature of our calling, that we are chosen through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. There's just a few things that we've heard this week, that there's a necessity of a purging of the conscience that has to happen before we're able to serve God, that uh, um, we've heard of the need to sanctify God in our own hearts, that we're being sanctified as we work out our salvation that Jesus sanctified himself, that he set himself apart, that he actually gave himself, that we might be able to be set apart in him. So as we progress into the text that I'm going to be covering this morning, um, this should be no surprise to us that as we consider the end to which, to which this work is progressing, again, we're talking about a separation, something, a, a calling to something, a setting apart, a separation of one people from another. And what God is doing in Christ Jesus is he is making a very unique being. This is, this is something that is unlike anything that has ever been created. There is no being in any, any of the, the, the heavenly hosts and anything else that God has created and that is, is unique as this people, as the people of God in Jesus Christ. Peter gave this description in his first epistle, a chosen generation. God initiated this. He performed it God's choice. A royal priesthood, a people called to serve him. A holy nation, ones that are characterized by the, even this very quality of God himself, holiness, set apart, a peculiar people. Now God, in doing so, it, it not, he's doing this not only for the glory that he's going to gain in the creation of the church and even in the finished product of the church, but all of these things are just a preparation for the greater glory that is to come. Things that will be worked out as this prepared people enter into their inheritance. The, what, the work that they have been uh, groomed for in the present will begin. Their heritage of the Lord, so to speak. Again, the text is in Acts chapter 20 and verse 32, and this is the phrase that I really want to focus on in this, this text, to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Now there, brethren, is an inexorable connection between sanctification and our inheritance that exists that we do well to see. This is something that, that has been very, the, the waters on this subject has been very muddied in our day. Now, firstly, as we look at this text, as the language suggests here, um, we see that this inheritance is an exclusive one. This is not something that is just granted to anyone or everyone. There, there's a very exclusive group of people that this applies to. And as much as many men in our day have attempted to concoct a doctrine that allows for unrepentant men uh, who are living their lives characterized by ungodliness to be saved in the end based upon their misunderstanding of God's desire that none should perish. This is a very, it's a very uh, serious thing, brethren. 
We, we, uh, this is not something that we have to wonder about. This is not an area which we have any kind of room to philosophize. We have very, very clear affirmations concerning this very subject in Scripture. And just two examples here in, in 1 Corinthians, and I, I don't know how much more clear you can get than this, but know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? He, he goes through this whole list of all these things. Uh, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, abusers of themselves and mankind. There are things that actually that, that can exclude you from being a partaker in this inheritance. He says this in Ephesians 5 also, that no whoremonger or unclean person or covetous man which is an idolater. He, he doesn't, it's like he doesn't have any law or part in this matter. He has no, no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ. Now, I think that you would probably get many, even uh, religious people, to agree with you on this. And they'd say, absolutely, all them horrible, terrible things, you know, that, that, that'll keep you away from God. But they may say, well, I, I don't do those things, so I'm not involved in any of that, so I'm all right. You know, I'm not a murderer. I've never killed anybody. I don't steal things. I'm not a fornicator. So I, I, I'm, I'm a pretty good person, you know. But Paul kind of raises the bar when he says in 1 Corinthians, he kind of cuts to the heart of the matter here. He says, now this I say, brethren, and this is the, the, the real issue here, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So, so the, uh, the obtaining of this inheritance is something, it's, it's a goal that men in the flesh can't, can't obtain to. It doesn't matter how, how wise you are. It is transcendent to the comprehension, even the comprehension of mortal men, of what this inheritance even involves. It is outside the realm of man's ambition and willpower. We know that we can't even possibly hope or dream high enough to what God has planned for those in Christ Jesus, let alone find ourselves equal to the task of, of making ourselves a, in a, to be able to obtain it. Now, this is a work of God, for sure, that we are speaking of this morning, brethren. And, and it's not merely God putting forth the promise of a coming inheritance, but of God himself setting apart a chosen people who will be the partakers of this exclusive inheritance in his son, Jesus. Now, although it's true that we, on our own merit could never um, attain to the greatness of such a reward. It's also true that God is not going to give this inheritance to anyone who is unworthy of receiving it. In the earth, this is very possible. We've seen this happen time and time again of men uh, who, have, who have received an inheritance of great wealth, and, that, and, and they are not adequate to, to, to get this inheritance. They're not the right kind of people to have this inheritance. They, they spoil it. They use it for the wrong thing. It's Before you know it, it's gone. Everything that the previous generation stored up and worked for, it got handed off to an unfaithful servant. But this, the, the inheritance that we're talking about uh, this morning is not on this wise. God, this, God is not going to waste this inheritance on those who will use it unwisely. Now, uh, Paul spoke to the brethren concerning this subject on at least two occasions that I could remember, at least, about the, talking about worthiness, about being worthy. And, and First Colossians, he says that you, that you would be worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. And First Thessalonians, he, he exhorted them that they would walk, actually walk worthy of God, who's called them into his kingdom and glory. So that being said, brethren, the question is, how exactly do you make yourself worthy? Now, this may sound like a bit of an oxymoron or a contradiction, but the, the, the truth is, although you have to be worthy, you can't make yourself worthy. I, I, I like how the, the Lord, he, he really puts you in kind of a paradox when it comes to this. That every one of us who are in Christ Jesus have, have at one point in our lives found ourselves in this situation where we, we finally realized what God required for us to be. Yet at the same time, we had learned by experience that in, in attempting to measure up to that standard, you were unable to do it. The only way that you learn that is if, is if you put your hand to it. And so you're put in a situation where the only thing that you can really do is trust in God. The only thing you can really do is flee to Jesus. To, to It's really only as you're backed into this kind of a spiritual corner, so to speak, that you will see your need for Christ. 
Well, as it concerns inheritance, brethren, he is able, God is able through Jesus Christ and the power of his Holy Spirit to make you what you need to be to partake of the inheritance. And this experience extends even uh, beyond your initial coming in as well. We understand that when we come in, it, there's a sense in which we're made worthy to partake. But this is an increasing in your experience of, of sanctification. We've talked about this a lot this week already, about how this is, a, this is a process. This is not a once-for-all declaration when you come in. There's a sense in which you've been sanctified to him, but there's also another very real sense in which this, this work has got to continue if it's going to um, come to fruition. Now, I just want to encourage you with this this morning, brethren, that in light of the many words in our generation that are spoken to the contrary about how we, can, we can't help but sin. You know, we, we all have our hang-ups and our mess-ups, and, you know, we're just, we're just fallible human beings. I, I know that I'm a man. I know that there is a part of me, a sinful nature in me, that if it had its way would distract me and even draw me away from the very purpose for which I live my life in Christ Jesus. I, I don't need that to be the emphasis of the preaching that I sit under. It's not going to do me any good. I, you know, every single day, this vile body that I am in reminds me of that very fact. What I need to hear is that through the grace of God, I'm actually able to overcome. I, I don't need to hear that I'm not a perfect person. I need to hear that through the grace of God, I'm actually able to be perfect before Him in word and in deed. I don't need to hear about how unworthy I am. That's been established. I need to hear that I am actually capable of walking worthy. That this, this can be done and it must be done. That I can actually live in a way that's in harmony with the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That I can actually live a life that is dominated by the pressing pursuit of the prize that is set before me in Christ Jesus. That this can actually happen. I can have this in experience that the overriding focus and direction of my life by the empowerment of the Spirit of God and by the provision of the captain of my salvation can actually be pointed heavenward. That can be the focus of your life, the overriding focus of your life that I can actually live in a way that the joyful expectation of the hope of the glory of God in Christ Jesus can overshadow and override any other pressing concern that I have in my life. Amen. And not because I've reached the point of perfection where I in and of myself am so deserving of the mercies of God that have been granted unto me, but because he ha He's given you of His Spirit. That, that you're able to abide in the one who is worthy. Because I can actually submit myself to the leading of the, of the work of God in preparing me to be a, be a participant in this inheritance and the saints in life. Now, I appreciated what uh, uh, Brother TJ said yesterday about um, th the lengths to which Jesus went to purchase his church. And within that context, and you, you know, really seriously think about this, does God break even? God forbid. Is he going to get less out of what he put into this? No. How is, how, how is that so? God, Jesus did not give his life and die for a church that is going to be a mediocre church, one who is not going to reflect his glory in the way that he designed so rest assured, brethren, that God in Christ Jesus is making a people who will be equal to enter into the inheritance. There's, there's, there's not going to be any waste. So we, we know that God is not like this. Uh, even, even on the earth, when Jesus multiplied the bread, the loaves and the fishes, what did he say afterwards? Gather up the fragments. Don't let anything go to waste. How much more so, brethren, the blessings that he has in heaven? Well, as I was thinking about this, I, I was reminded of this uh, text in Colossians. This, this, this language has stuck with me uh, for some time now. I, I remember when I first took a hold of what he was saying in this text, and it's, it's, it's like an energizer for your spirit. It says, giving thanks unto the Father, which, which hath made us, he hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. 
Brethren, you have been granted all things that are necessary for you to enter into and continue in the calling of God to obtain this inheritance. And in Christ Jesus, God has actually delivered you from the dominion of the devil. He's placed you in the arena where the resources are. Let's, let's just re rehearse for a minute some of the things that you've been given. You, you've been sanctified by the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. When you came into him, you were cleansed. You experienced that purge conscience that our brother Dan talked about this week. Um, You've actually been given full advantage and access to the throne of grace in time of need. You're given a spiritual refuge to go to in Christ Jesus, a place to, to rest in heavenly places with him. Just to say all these things in summary, brethren, you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. The same Jesus in whose death you were buried into can empower you to keep the flesh on the cross. That the same Jesus whose resurrection life you were raised to walk in can continue to quicken you. And the same Jesus who bought you to keep you can, can actually stop you from selling yourself back to the wicked one. Back to, to, to lesser pursuits. Amen. Now... Um, to continue in this consideration as it touches our joy and our confidence, our, uh, um, what motivates us in the spirit. This inheritance that we talk about is not just some kind of nebulous reward that we will partake of sometime in the distant future that we don't really know a whole lot about. We actually have received an earnest of our inheritance. Uh, we have tasted of the powers of the world to come. We've actually been given spiritually a taste of, of, of the, 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 the very things that are there in the world to come. We're not just, we're not just being given like a, like a tiny little preview. or so. We're actually given some of the actual substance that we're going to be partaking of there. Now, in the, the first chapter of Ephesians here, I'm, I'm going to read these four verses. It's kind of lengthy, but... The, the, the th I, I, didn't, I didn't want to break up the thought. This is all one solid thought. That in the dispensation and the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have uh, obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. And, and, and here's when he's, he's, he's going to start to talk about this, this uh, earnest here. In whom also after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. It's like he's saying, just, just wait. I'm, I'm giving you a taste. This is my promise to you that I'm going I'm to I'm fulfill this. And as, as we recognize the work that God has done in us in this matter, it, it actually enables us to continue with confidence. This fosters a confidence in you that you can't have any other way. Now, firstly, when we talk about this, this earnest, he, he refers to it before that as a seal, as, as a, a protection. And I, I, I realize that may be somewhat of a crude parallel, but I thought about this. You know, you, almost every single day you deal with this, with, with products and things that you have that have a seal on them. And what, is, what does it say on there? It says, sealed for your protection. The, 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 it's like a, det a deterrent against spoiling. And, and in many cases, like medicine, there's a seal that says tamper seal, tamper evident. You can see if somebody's tampered with this. It's to stop somebody from modifying it so it'll make you sick and potentially even kill you. Well, the Holy Spirit's been given to you in this kind of a capacity as well. It's like a, it's like a shield against, against defiling influences. And we've been promised it. If you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Why is that? It's like a seal. It's like a protection, a provision that guards against any, any possible contamination. And this seal can also be seen as like a mark of approval. You know, like the, the, the presidential seal. You know, in, the, 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 in old times when they, they wrote letters from dignitaries or kings, something that was important, that they wanted to verify that this really was a letter from the king. They, they, they uh, sealed it with wax and there was a stamp on there that was the seal of the kingdom, the seal of the king. 
a, a mark that distinguishes that this is from your king. Well, God has placed a seal on you, brethren, a, a mark that distinguishes you as his. It says, this belongs to the king. This is like the preliminary tracing, as it were, to the writing that he spoke about in Revelation when he said, To him that overcometh, I'll make a pillar in the house of my God, and I'll ride on him. I'll ride on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God in my new name. So we're, we're kind of experiencing the first fruits of that, brethren. Here we've, we've, been, we've been sealed, we've been pressed with a mark. Now when we use the word earnest, this is a, a financial word. This is like... A, a, a word that denotes a reservation. Uh, we, we've been given like a down payment, as it were, of glory. A, a, a divine promise and an, an incentive that confirms to us the truth of this promise. That I bought you, you're mine. And, and, and this whets our, actually whets our um, appetite for the coming fulfillment of it. It, it encourages us. It, it bears witness to us that God has done this. That he has chosen us through sanctification of the Spirit. Now when I uh, consider this subject, I'm continually reminded of this verse in the 8th chapter of Romans. And, well, most of you who hear me speak on a regular basis, you've heard me refer back to this text many times. But it, I, I, this, the, the confidence and the assurance that, that you get from this is, is unrivaled. You cannot get this from anywhere else. And this, this ties into the uh, obtainment of this inheritance as well. It says, For you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption. That there's this witness in you whereby you cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit itself bears witness with your spirit that you're a child of God. Uh, let me tell you, brethren, this witness is one that can't be replaced by anything else. The, the assurance, the peace, the calmness of soul and mind that this witness grants to you cannot be obtained by any other means. When, when you perceive within yourself the very Spirit of God living and moving, when you have this this internal witness of your adoption as a son of God, that he's made you his son, there is no substitute for that. There is no program of man. There is no procedure. There's no book that you can read. There's no tape that you can listen to that can manufacture this confidence in you. And he continues, and if children, there's an implication here. If, if you're a children, what else are you? Then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Now we've been talking uh, thus far about an inheritance that has been promised unto you. But I, I, I suppose if we wanted to be more precise, we should say that it's, a, it's an inheritance that God has promised that you'll be able to partake of in Christ Jesus. Really, we're, we're partaking of the inheritance that's Christ's. And inheritances are granted unto heirs. You know, the, the, the wealth is passed down from uh, one individual or one family to the succeeding generations. And, and often it, it involves more than just passing on of things, you know. There's like, a, there's like a family legacy that's being passed on here. Well, brethren, God is like extending his own personality in this. What we, what we are inheriting is, is, is greater of a greater wealth than you could ever possibly imagine. This, this inheritance involves more just getting something from Jesus. This is actually being in Jesus, being part of him in that in inheritance. It's, it's, it's a matter that's based on our sonship. We become joint heirs with the firstborn, and, and as a result, as we've been like written into the living will and testament of God in, in, the, in the Lamb's book of life. Now, all this being said, it should be noted that um, after everything is said and done, sanctification, the, the, the initial work of it, being set apart, being called out, the continuance of it, this means absolutely nothing if the work is not brought to fruition. If you don't receive the inheritance, then like, what, did, what, did, what, was, the, what was the point? But brethren, I... I I can, I can tell you confidently that we have been given all things that are required for us to finish a good race. We've been given an inner witness and a confidence, a written testimony, a place of safety and retreat, grace and power from Christ himself. But if we don't avail ourselves of these things, it's, it's, it's possible for you to end up in the end having nothing. 
And uh, actually, Paul, as he's writing this to the Romans in this 8th chapter of Romans, he, like, he puts a qualifier on this very text. Join heirs with Christ. You know, that's a very profound thing. But he says, if so be that you suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So when you partake of Christ, th this, this joining is such a complete joining that there's some other things that you're going to have to partake of as well. If you want to partake of the life of Christ, well, then you're going to have to partake of the death as well. If you want to partake of the inheritance, then there's going to be some partaking of the suffering as well. But praise God, there's, there's provision for us to, to go through that. Now, um, I had one uh, last word that I wanted to encourage you with before um, we ended this today, and that is that this, this inheritance that we're talking about today being a partaker of that is not one that's not necessarily equally divided among those who have been made joint heirs. And, and now on the surface, this may not necessarily seem like, like it's an encouraging thing, but uh, this, this is actually a great motivator, brethren, to know that, that although in a sense all those who are in Christ will have an abundant entrance into the heavenly kingdom, some people's entrance is going to be more abundant than others. Our brother Paul, who labored more abundantly than they all, do you not think that he's going to be bestowed more honor abundantly than they all? That he's, he's going to partake of a, of a, of a greater measure? Um, after all, brethren, the goal is not simply to, to uh, barely skirt by, to just escape damnation, you know, but, but to enter in with great substance, to have an abundant, abundant entrance. And this is the reason why we're exhorted in this way to, to store up treasures for yourselves in heaven. Uh, brethren, you will never, ever regret the things that you gave up to be able to do that. So, uh, um, and well, and I, I also want to encourage you that although it may seem like it at the time, that your labors are never in vain. We don't know on this side of glory the, the, the people that we have affected, the things that we have done for God, just, just simply by giving what has been given to you. Don't, don't, the, the, the things that the Lord has given you, use them. Apply yourself to this. So in, in closing, I exhort you, brethren, to, to press in concerning this matter. And the reason why is because you can labor with confidence. This is not something that we have to do uncertainly. We, we, we have testimony. We have testimony even within ourselves that God is able to make you meet to this inheritance. Thank you, brethren.